So, um, in general, um, we engage in some kind of hypothesis testing. And often this is a form of inquiry that's tied to quantitative analysis, but among qualitative researchers too, often they have like an idea in their head and they have to be able to sort of articulate what is it that the thing that I'm interested in and how do I believe that the variables of interest are related to one another? Hypotheses are simply a claim about the core variation between variables. And as you'll recall, all hypotheses are, are things that we seek not to prove, but to disprove. So our approach to a hypothesis is not to say, how is my hypothesis correct? Instead, it's to say, how might my hypothesis be wrong? And how should I evaluate that um, uh, potential? So I'm just going to present four elements to a hypothesis. There's the population of interest, there's the situation or condition that they're in, and then there's a relationship between two variables, an independent variable and a dependent variable. The population is the group that you wanna study. And in a moment, I'm gonna go through this in very, very extensive detail, and I'm showing you a chart that I think will really help. But often you're not studying everybody, you're studying some group. So I might be interested in students at universities. And so there, there's going to be lots of people who aren't part of my population of inquiry, I'm not interested in people who are already graduated from universities and older. I'm not interested in people who don't go to university, I'm not interested in people who are too young to be in university. The population is the group that you want to know something about. Sometimes it's the world, but it's almost never the world. It's usually some defined group that you're interested in. The second thing that you need to know is the circumstances that they're in. These are circumstances that limit the population or the situations in which you're interested in for members of that population. So if I'm interested in young people who are college students, the situation there may be for young people who are in college because lots of young people are not in college. And so, you know, I might limit them to a particular condition. If you're studying income, your condition of um, uh, the population of the participants might be of a working age. So if I'm interested in income, I might exclude people below the ages of 18, as well as people above the ages of 68. Because for many of those people, they are not of what we would consider a working age. Of course, depends upon the context that we're talking about. But the condition is the situation that the population is in. If you're studying why women decide to have children, you might limit the population to the condition of childbearing age or who have had at least one child. And then, as we said earlier, we're interested in the independent variable and the dependent variable. And as I um, uh, said to you, the independent variable is going to be the thing that causes the change and the dependent variable is going to be the thing um, uh, that is affected by the independent variable. So I want us to now talk about how we convert this general form of a hypothesis into an operational hypothesis or a study that we would actually do. So that is, if all hypotheses have some version of this formulation, how do we transform that formulation into something that we study? And I'm going to draw upon the research of um, uh, social psychologists at Stanford from the 1970s who did an interesting study. It's got its problems like all studies, but did an interesting study about the relationship between status, frustration, and aggression. And their hypothesis was that there's some relationship between the status of the person who's frustrating you and whether or not you're likely to be aggressive to them. So, you know, many of us have had experiences where our bosses have frustrated us. The people who um, are in charge of our work have frustrated us. But given that they're our bosses, given that they have high status, they have status over us, we may be unlikely to express aggression to them. By contrast, we may have some people who are subordinate to us who work for us, 
who frustrate us. And when they do, we're more likely to express aggression. So this study was interested in the relationship between status and aggression, the status of people and how it affects the likelihood of aggression. The question becomes, you may be interested in this, but how are you actually going to study it? So we're going to ask how it is that we take this general form of a hypothesis, turn it into an abstract form, and then operationalize it with variables into a study that we would actually do. So here um, is the uh, a way in which to think about this. Earlier, I said to you there's going to be four parts of all hypotheses. For a population in a particular condition, independent variable X causes dependent variable Y. So I could say for people of a working age, um, or for people in the United States of a certain working age, their education is going to cause some degree of their earnings, right? Or I could say, for people who are in a condition of frustration, the status of the person frustrating them is going to inhibit or affect their aggression. So here I'm interested in, you know, you can see how different kinds of things can fit within this general model. And an exercise that you might do after the, this lecture is to think about something that you're interested in and ask, how would you fit it into this chart? How would you define the population of interest? How would you put the, understand the condition that you're interested in them being in? And then how would you think about the relationship between two variables? Now, once you define the abstract form of your hypothesis, people who are frustrated, the status of the frustrator affects whether or not you're going to express aggression. You have to, to find a way to convert your variables into things that you actually measure. And so this is the question of what we call operationalization. How are you going to operationalize your variable? And operationalization is something that we always have to do. Operationalization is how we convert variables into items that can be measured. Variables are abstract ideas, but abstract ideas always have to be measured. We have to convert them into something that we can actually measure. And we always are going to make assumptions when we measure variables. We'll make a series of assumptions about it. So let me give you a few examples of this. How do we operationalize stress? That is, we have a concept, a variable, stress. And then we have to ask ourselves, how do we actually measure that variable? Well, there are different ways in which we could measure stress. We could give people a series of questions, psychological evaluation, that may tell us about their stress. We could look at their frequency of certain kinds of behaviors. So we could look to see how likely it is that they maybe go to the bathroom because maybe people go to the bathroom more frequently when they're stressed. I'm not really sure about that, um, but um, uh, we could see basically how frequently is it that they do something. Um, maybe they, at, they keep asking the same question. So um, uh, if um, uh, uh, you and I are, are going to go to an event, like let's say a work um, uh, meeting, and we're late, I might ask you, how much longer is it going to take us to get there? How much longer is it going to take us to get there? That's going to be a behavior that I ask multiple times, and it could be an indication of stress. It could be a way of measuring stress. We could also do physical tests. We could measure people's heart rate, their blood pressure, the amount that they're sweating. All of these things would tell us about stress, but it's important to note that the physical tests of stress are different than the psychological tests of stress. These are different ways of measuring the variable, and they all have assumptions built into them. So, you know, another example would be many of, so what, I, one step back. The idea here is that many of the things that we want to study cannot be measured directly. We can't actually directly observe satisfaction, for instance. 
If we want to know how satisfied parents are with their child's school curriculum, we can't just see directly how satisfied they are. It's not a visible characteristic. We have to develop often questions or other methods to get at the topic. So we could ask parents directly, how satisfied are you with the principles? That, that, that could be one way to figure out parental satisfaction. We could also look at the number of complaints that parents filed about the curriculum. Or we could see how many parents removed their children from a school. That would be one thing to do. We could ask teachers about their interactions with parents and what they think parents feel about the curriculum. These are three different ways to measure the same concept. And there are usually many different ways to operationalize any one concept or variable. Critical for you to understand is that that measurement almost always relies upon an assumption. There's no escaping measurement assumptions for almost all variables, but some are more justified than others. I want to give you two final examples here. Demographers study three things, births, deaths, and migration. And one of the great advantages of studying demography is that deaths are highly measurable, right? I mean, we know in general when people die, and it's not subject to a measurement assumption. They are either alive or dead. And so in some instances, variables are highly measurable and easy to operationalize. But for almost everything else, it's not totally clear. I want you to think back to the early lectures, the early theoretical lectures, and how Marx and Weber had different definitions of class. So Marx's definition of class was... Um, your position within the mode of production. Do you tell people what to do or are you told what to do? So the mode of production is gonna be how things are produced and your class position is gonna be determined about whether or not you have a control over other people's labor or other people control your labor. That's one way to think about class. Weber, by contrast, thought about class as your position within market relations, or maybe more simply, how much money do you have? Now, neither Marx nor Weber's conceptualization of class is like better or worse, but they're going to be different. And so when we study things, we're going to have to ask, how do we operationalize the concept that we're interested in? If we are Marxians, we're people who support Marxist theory, we're going to operationalize the concept of class differently than if we're Weberians. Because if we're Marxist, we might ask people, how much control do you have over your work? And if we're Weberians, we might ask people, how much money do you have? These are two very different things. What I'd like you to think about here is not how one is better or worse, but that when you look at a study, you have to critically evaluate how it is that they converted a concept into a measure. How is it that you turn an idea into something that you actually measure? And then how do you measure it? How do you really do that thing? So um, just as we said with stress, where you could think about it as a psychological test, the frequency of certain kinds of behaviors or a physical test, um, or with satisfaction, where you could ask parents about their level of satisfaction, teachers about the level of parent satisfaction, or look at certain behaviors like the frequency at which people file complaints. All of these things are ways of measuring that have assumptions behind them. And as scholars, you have to be clear about what that assumption is, allow other scholars to evaluate it, but also recognize that you're almost always making an assumption. There's really no research, almost no research, without measurement assumptions. So let's go back to the Stanford experiment for a moment and see how this works. <laughs> 
So here's what the Stanford experiment was. Um, it was a group of researchers and social psychologists who decided on a Sunday to drive around Palo Alto, California. And um, they drove, you know, on Sunday for a host of reasons. Um, um, nobody was heading to work. They didn't want to harm people in the research that they were doing. Um, there were fewer people on the road. There were lots of advantages to doing it on a Sunday. And there was a professor and a graduate student. And the professor uh, drove a Cadillac, a really nice car. And the graduate student drove their graduate student car, an old beat up Toyota, let's say. Or maybe it was a Honda. I, I don't even remember what car it was. It's, it's a while ago now since um, the experiment was done. And so these are two very different cars. Right? One is a fancy kind of new car and one is a beat up old car. And what they did was they drove to a red light. They stopped at that red light. And then they waited for the red light to turn green and they didn't move. And they saw whether or not the person behind them, the person driving behind them, beeped at them. How quickly they beeped, how long it took them to beep, how long they beeped. Did they just hit their horn quickly or did they really hold it down? And this, to the researchers, was a way to study the relationship between frustration and aggression and status. So they're thinking, you know, we're going to have people who are stuck at a, at, a, at a green light where they should be able to drive. They're going to be stuck behind either a high-status car or a low-status car. And then beeping the horn is going to be an expression of frustration, I mean, an expression of aggression. I'll say that again. Beeping the horn is going to be an expression of aggression. So let's look at how each phase of this builds in a series of assumptions about how it is that you might measure something. So initially, the general form of the hypothesis is for population P in condition C, independent variable X, causes or is in a causal relationship to dependent variable Y. And the abstract form of the hypothesis in this particular case is that for people who are frustrated, the status of the frustrator is going to relate to either inhibit or promote aggression. So how do they operationalize people? Well, they operationalize it by studying people driving around Palo Alto on a Sunday morning. Now, there's a huge number of assumptions here. I mean, the first is that like people driving around Palo Alto are not like people in the world. Palo Alto is kind of a wealthy suburb of San Francisco. It's um, where Stanford University is, and it's a highly educated area. It's not representative of the general population. This is an issue of external validity. So the ways in which they measured the population is going to have problems for the generalizability of this study. Sunday also is not representative of every day. Sunday is a very unique day. It's because on Sundays in Palo Alto, at the time that this study was being done, nobody's going to work or very few people are going to work. And so it's different than people in their day-to-day -day lives where they are working. So there's going to be some assumptions about whether or not this population of study that's been operationalized actually represents people. And my assertion is going to be that the population under study doesn't represent people at all. All it represents are people that were driving around that Sunday in Palo Alto. Now, more importantly here, in terms of seeing the measurement assumption, is to think about frustration. So is it the case that being blocked for several seconds at a green light is frustrating? Maybe. I mean, for some of us, it might be really frustrating. But the question should be, like, are there other ways to measure frustration? How else would you observe frustration? How justifiable is the assumption that blocking someone at a green light for several seconds is a way to capture the variable of frustration? In my view, it's not bad. It's, it's, not a, it's a kind of creative and interesting way to think about frustration. 
But you should realize that frustration can't be directly observed. We have to operationalize the variable. And as we operationalize the variable, we're going to make an assumption. We're going to assume that blocking people for several seconds at a green light actually frustrates them. The next assumption is that people recognize the difference between a Cadillac and a beat up Toyota. So the assumption here is that the quality of a car is a good reflection of a measure of status. So we might ask ourselves, is this a good measure of status? Are the people who are being part of this experiment actually recognizing the differences between these two kinds of cars? Now, I think this isn't a bad assumption, and it's probably because I have a series of my own assumptions about California. People in California care about cars, and they tend to notice cars, and people themselves care about cars. Their cars are status indicators frequently. So, you know, the reason people buy a Mercedes is not because a Mercedes is just a much better car than a Toyota. It's actually probably a little more likely to break down than a Toyota. Instead, what they're conveying is their social position. I am rich enough to own a Mercedes. So I think that, like, actually the quality of the car isn't a bad measure of, of status, it's not a perfect measure of status. There's all kinds of assumptions that people recognize the car, that the reason that people have expensive cars is to demonstrate their status. There's lots of things that are built into this as an assumption that this is a good measure of status. And again, I'm going to say to you, there's no way to directly measure status. This is one of the deep challenges with social science is that we almost always have to make assumptions about our measurements. Finally, um, so we would think that the high status inhibits, so that means they do less aggression. Um, so here, they measured three things. Did the person honk? How many times did they honk? How long did they wait before they honked? So, First question is, does the person ever honk their horn? Maybe they just sit there and wait peacefully. The second is, how frequently do they honk? Do they do it multiple times or just once? And then the third is, how long do they wait? Do they honk immediately or do they wait a little bit before they honk? Now, this is, to me, in the study, probably the biggest assumption of measurement. Because the question is, is horn honking an expression of aggression? Now, culturally, if you were in different contexts, the answer would almost certainly be no. So my father is from Pakistan. And like in Pakistan, horn honking is not an expression of aggression. It's a form of communication. Like drivers kind of communicate and indicate where they are on the road by honking their horn. But this was done in Palo Alto. It wasn't done in Pakistan. So maybe there it's a pretty good measure. But it makes me think horn honking isn't necessarily being aggressive. It could be a way in which drivers are informing other drivers about what's happening. It could be a way in which a driver is saying, hey, the light is green versus I'm mad at you. Why haven't you gone yet? And so as a measure, one of the things that we would ask is, is this measuring the same thing? And the reason I would be particularly concerned about this is that people could be honking for different reasons given the independent variable. So let me be clear about this. People could honk the same number of times or after the same period of time for the high status car versus the low status car. But for the high status car, they could be saying, hey, the light is green. And for the low status car, they could be saying, move, you need to move. They could be getting aggressive. And so here, the measurement assumption of horn honking has built into it a potential problem of pollution 
relative to the independent variable. In one instance, the measurement could reflect information, and in the other, it could reflect aggression, and there's no way to know. There's literally no way to know in this study. Now, what did I want you to learn from this exercise? I wanted you to learn three things. The first is that as you're constructing a study design, I would encourage you to at least try to generate a study design in light of this sort of structure of hypotheses from a general form to an abstract form to an oper operational form. Even if you don't end up fully doing this, it's a very useful exercise to try and understand the relationship between things that you're interested in. That's one. The second thing I'd like you to know or see here is that almost all social research requires assumptions that the way in which you are measuring about, about how the way in which you're measuring something reflects the concept that you're interested in. Let me say that again because I stumbled a little bit. I want you to remember that the way in which you're measuring something, it's, it assumes that it's a good representation of the concept, but it's almost always resting on that assumption. I'll give another example. Um, I might be interested in gender, and you may say to yourself, well, gender is really easy to measure. And I would reply, actually, gender is kind of hard to measure because you could think about gender as, in a biological sense, the presence of different kinds of chromosomes. It's a perfectly reasonable way to measure gender. Um, but you could also think about gender in different ways, about how people self-identify. That's a different way to measure gender. Or maybe you're not interested in gender as like male, female. Maybe you're interested in it in a, in, or a biological sense of sex, maybe you're interested in it as degrees of masculinity and femininity. And that there are a series of traits that, are, that you identify as being part of masculinity and a series of traits that you identify as being part of femininity. And some people with the same biological sex have very different representations of their masculinity or femininity. And so you might have men who are highly feminine on your scale, and women who are highly masculine on your scale. And I would say that's very legitimate. It is a legitimate way to go about thinking about measuring something. What do I want you to then know? That there are almost always measurement assumptions relative to your variables. Variables are very difficult to measure directly, and we have to make assumptions. That doesn't make research bad. It just is a necessity when doing sociological research or social science research more generally. Finally, the third thing I wanted you to learn from this exercise is to see the ways in which I critically engaged with this work. I think it's actually a really interesting paper. I think we learned something from it. I think it's valuable, but I was skeptical of it. I was purposefully skeptical of it. There's a form here of organized skepticism of this paper where I critically evaluated the sample, where I critically evaluated and said the sample isn't very representative of the population. I critically evaluated the assumptions of the ways in which they measured the variables of interest. And the purpose of this is not to say it's a bad study or it's a good study, but instead to say it's a study and my job as a social scientist is to critically evaluate the quality of that study and to do so with the tools that I have available to me and my own particular insights. Okay, I'm gonna stop here. In the next lecture, we're gonna pick up and talk about sampling and the ways in which maybe the sample from this study wasn't ideal and we might be able to do different kinds of samples that will allow us to make better assumptions about or a different set of assumptions about the generalizability of the things that we've looked at.